And when I then kind of landed into a professional business development role, I very quickly learned that everything that I had done before was terrible. <laughs> I was very bad at it. Um, I had no systems in place. I didn't quite understand how to hold a conversation or how to guide a conversation, how to listen well, right? And how to understand the needs of the people that I was talking to. And so that's really how Tyler Tactics was born for me. It was out of those conversations and out of that realization that maybe I'm not the only architect that experienced these difficulties or that feels this way where I, you know, don't actually know or have systems in place to um, best communicate with my clients or with my ideal clients. Hello, everybody, and welcome finally to another episode of the Creative Insider Podcast. We are back and now there will be more episodes on the go. Today's episode, Tyler Similar, very popular architect on LinkedIn. He's famous with his uh, TylerTactics.com. It's a website, also a newsletter where he shares tactics to architects, how to attract better clients, the clients of your dreams, how to start your own practice, how to develop it, and how to use these smart work workarounds to really land the first project and many more. As you know, here at the Creative Insider Podcast, we don't stay superficial. So I ask the hard questions. Why does he has the knowledge to teach you that? Uh, how did he gather the experience? What is he doing now? How he left architecture to do this? What else is he doing? So the whole interview was super awesome. Tyler was super nice, super kind. And I think he's a very legit guy. Before we start, I want to thank you for watching this podcast. I want to ask you to subscribe to the channel because it's for free, to like the video, comment below with your opinions after you watch the whole video, of course. And from now on, because of you, because of so many people watching the channel, the channel started to grow and there is a possibility for you to support the existence of the podcast by clicking the super thanks button where you can offer a very small monetary support so that we have the resources to produce the podcast. And also there are three uh, sort of tiers with which you can subscribe. The interns, the uh, senior, and the uh, partners. So please do subscribe. There are just a few bucks. You're going to get um, also some perks, special emojis, and also early access to the new episodes. Thank you very much and enjoy the podcast. Hello, Tyler. Welcome to the Creative Insider Podcast. It took a while, uh, but uh, I'm super happy <laughs> to have you. <laughs> yes, that is my fault. I apologize for the massive delay and then basically springing it on you, I think, within like a few days. So, you know, no, got to keep you on your toes. Nothing to apologize. <laughs> Actually, it was not a complaint. It happens a lot of time to me that I say people, I'm going to send you the invitation and then I'm super busy and yeah. then I do the same uh, thing. But uh, it was uh, super, I was super excited when I saw that you replied positively because uh, I've been following you on LinkedIn where you're quite popular. Uh, we're going to talk yeah. about that. And uh, also I subscribe to your newsletter. So you're one of the, oh, the people I read. Uh, the newsletter is called Tyler Taxi Tactics. Um, but I was curious because we live in a day and age where there are a lot of people trying to teach online, trying to spread their knowledge and to share their knowledge, which is nice. But it's also per for me personally, as the Creative Insider podcast host, it's nice to discover more and beyond uh, the what we see like superficially on the on the social media. So if you can yeah. introduce yourself, who you are, how you become an architect, uh, you can introduce yourself in the way you like. Sure. Yeah. Well, my name is Tyler Sumula. Um, I'm trained as an architect, so I have a bachelor's of science in architecture. I have a uh, master's in architecture. Um, I've worked at an international firm. I've run my own design studio for a couple of years before transitioning into the tech side and the creator side, just like uh, Georgie here. Uh, <laughs> uh, with the podcast, I have a I have a newsletter called Tyler Tactics, which you can join at uh, join.tylertactics.com. There's a coming up on 4,000 architects that uh, read that every week. That's a weekly newsletter where I basically share tactics to help you and other architects attract high quality clients. Um, this was the most curious part for me. Um, 
I don't know what is your current situation. Do you have your own uh, architecture office or architecture practice? As far as I know, you're based in the United States also, right? Yes, I am based in the United States. Um, I do not have my own practice anymore. I stopped that. Um, I think it was, it's funny. I think I actually stopped it. I think I, it was maybe one of my first or second posts I ever made on LinkedIn. Um, and I started posting on LinkedIn in January of 2022. So about a year and a half or almost two years ago now. And so I had said something along the lines of, I just dissolved. I just formally dissolved my, uh, my design practice. <laughs> and um, I want to shift from, you know, doing my own work to helping others do theirs. And so that's, that's the shift that I've made. And since then, I've obviously been working at, um, I work at Monograph full time. Um, I have this side business here, Tyler Tactics on the side. And I also advise another startup called Ace Lab. Um, how, how did you come up uh, with the idea of closing your own practice and start helping others develop their um, better clientele, let's just say so? Yeah. I think I'm always chasing fulfillment. I don't like chasing passion. I think passion is a little, that's like a tougher word. It's a tougher thing to chase because it doesn't always necessarily, uh, I don't think it always leads you to where you want to end up. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We've, we've all chased passion many times before, uh, I think probably, and uh, it has mixed results. So I've, I've, I kind of made the change to chase fulfillment and fulfillment is a little bit more, it's like, um, it's a bit more intern. It's like a mix of internal and external validation. Right. I think in my opinion, but for me, I had, you know, worked at firms and I hadn't felt fulfilled necessarily in everything I was doing. So then the natural progression there <clears throat> is, well, let me just start my own, <laughs> let me start my own practice, see how that goes. Um, and so I did that for a couple of years as well and kind of fell into the same realization where I was like, ah, I'm not sure if this is exactly, uh, this doesn't feel like the right fit. I know that I love architecture. I know that I love a lot of, I know that I love teaching architecture. I know that I love a lot of these, um, a lot of the elements of architecture, but I haven't found that fulfillment that I'm looking for. Not that I necessarily know what it is yet, but I haven't found it, you know, working in firms and having my own practice. So that's when I started looking for alternative ways that I could continue to use my background in architecture um, in different ways, right? So that's when I started looking at the tech side and made a relatively aggressive jump, right, from, from running my own uh, studio, from running my own design studio, basically into an entry-level uh, business development position and have uh, moved up from there since then. And so... I started posting on LinkedIn as a result of that, right? It was kind of like, I feel as though I'm, I'm learning a lot. I think posting, posting my own um, feelings and experience could be helpful, you know, along that line, at least for me. I mean, if anything, if anything, I'm speaking into a void, but at least I'm learning. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning the things that I'm um, putting out into the world. And so when I started posting online, I realized that a lot of other people, and when I started talking to my friends from school as well, right, a lot of other people I think had had a similar experience. Um, and my experience was such that even when I was running my own studio, I actually had no idea what I was doing <laughs> with business development, right? You kind of just go, like, I didn't have a system. I basically went into everything just like free flowing, like, all right, I'll have a conversation with you. I hope that this, I hope that this tends to work out, right? And when I then kind of landed into a professional business development role, I very quickly learned that everything that I had done before was terrible. <laughs> I was very bad at it. Um, I had no systems in place. I didn't quite understand how to hold a conversation or how to guide a conversation, how to listen well, right, and how to understand the needs of the people that I was talking to. And so that's really how Tyler Tactics was born for me. It was out of those conversations and out of that realization that, Maybe I'm not the only architect that experienced these difficulties or that feels this way where I, you know, don't actually know or have systems in place to um, best communicate with my clients or with my ideal clients. What exa which environment exactly you were mentioning that you landed that was a professional business acquisition environment? Is that at uh, Monograph? As far as I know, Monograph is this uh, 
a software company that uh, provides architects with project. Or I don't know if only architects, but makes project management software, right? Yeah, it's basically a performance management um, platform for architects and engineers. So helping them manage things along with uh, projects and finances and staffing and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, it was at it was at Monograph, which was great because it's kind of this like meta thing, right, where I'm actually I'm uh, an ex architect then speaking to thousands of architects like over over the time frame now. Right, understanding understanding their challenges and what what uh, challenges they're having in their practice, and um, learning a lot about the industry in that way as well. But yeah, that was that was the role. So the role was to like basically speak to architects and um, eventually pitch them the software. Right? I mean, as far as I understand, this is the business acquisition. So this was your first step, sort of out of the traditional architecture. Yes. Yeah. On the tech side, they do things like a little bit differently, right? So they typically have a sales development position, which is essentially the, the person that's meant to do the cold outreach or warm outreach, cold or, or warm outreach um, that's meant to understand whether a person or a firm or a client is a good potential fit for the service. And then there's another role that's known as more like an account executive, you know, essentially a closer which is the person that's meant to then nurture that relationship all the way through, dive a bit deeper into the pain points, um, understand, show, like actually show the product and how it would work within that firm. And did you like proactively decide, did you find out some like uh, job um, announcement from the software and you decided to try this out? And, or how did you, like, did you proactively approach them to join them? How did that happen? Yeah, so I had made again a pretty like tough decision where I was like, all right, I want I know that I I know that I'm not fulfilled in this role. I want to transition into tech. I think that business development and sales is a direction that I'd like to move. I'd like to at least try it out. So I applied to a bunch of jobs, honestly. I applied to a bunch of them and had a lot of interviews just to understand what that process was like. And I actually ended up taking a job with a data analytics company in that same role for a few months. And then I was watching Monograph very closely just because, you know, that is, <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing startup. It's probably one of the more popular startups like in the architecture and engineering industry at this point right now, right? So, and it was the same a couple of years ago. Um, so I was watching them closely and I saw that they were beginning to hire out their sales team. So then I proactively reached out to them and asked if they were looking for the role that I was in. Um, and it was just, you know, it was just good timing. <laughs> it was, it was good timing. They hadn't even posted the job yet, but they said that they were getting ready to post it. So I actually became the first hire in that role at Monograph. I'm curious about something more personal about this personal experience you have had. I'm 31 and uh, I'm an architect in a big architecture. It's actually not only architecture practice, but I've worked in several big architecture practices. I'm based in Germany and yeah. I hear a lot of people my age and I guess you must be somewhere my age, maybe a little slightly younger or the same. I don't know. Um, and uh, I hear a lot of uh, people that are this age, millennials particularly, that say, I don't imagine myself doing this for my whole life. Um, yeah. As you say, there is a lot of unfulfillment. But in the same time, we architects have this really weird uh, profession because we are like not technical, but not creative completely. Uh, <laughs> we are... Yeah. We, we care not only about the money, but we care about what we are doing. So it's a very weird thing. Um, it's not like you go somewhere, you just do your job and you get your money and then you're happy. It just m goes beyond that. And also we have this sort of like we hold to this role, to this identity. It's a little bit like the sports guy that like, I don't know, basketball player when they retire, no, they, they lose a little bit of their identity. How, yeah. how did you come up mm. to the conclusion that you wanted to leave this? What were your pain points that were pushing mm. you? What was making you so, um, yeah, unfulfilled with the with the profession? Because I think 
a lot of the old school architects don't want to address this. They just go with this no, a don't. little bit, uh, suck it up. Uh, it's part of the yeah. game. The young people, <laughs> the young people are always always complaining and stuff like that. But I think it's not the right approach because you're not gonna create a dialogue or create a conversation about it. So I'm curious, you as someone that took that those steps, what was for you the the struggle? Yeah. Well, you know, we live in the information age, right? So I think the difference between our generation and the uh, generations ahead of us is that we have access to more. We've had access to more information as we as we've like come into our careers, and with information, just tends to come more options, right? So you're just look, you're, you're just more aware. <laughs> you know, you're more aware of different career opportunities. You're more aware of different options as you're coming into it. And I actually just had this conversation with, um, with someone else. And it, it, is, it sounds like she was probably in a similar role as you. Um, she's been working at a, she's been, she's been out of school for six or seven years now. She's, you know, not feeling like this, like the traditional path is the right path for her um, for various reasons. But, you know, for me, it's kind of like you're, you come out and I remember, I remember working at a large international firm and I come out and I'm working in a studio, just like I think many of us are, if we're like, if we're working in a large firm, you know, we work with a pocket of, of people. We work with a group of people in a studio on a specific project or on a specific type of project. And I remember looking around there and there was a, you know, there was a studio manager that had been there for 25 years, just looked completely exhausted. Um, there was, there was, um, another kind of studio leader there that had been there for almost 10 years and was trying to become an associate, um, also looked very exhausted, right? They just, they just like, you know, they didn't look happy. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't look happy. And if you have any, if you have that kind of awareness, you're looking around, you're like, okay, what is like, what does the next five, 10, 20 years look like? Is this something that I want to commit to? Um, and then you're looking at how many, you know, how many hours they're still spending in the office. And it's basically the same amount as us, you know, we're in there for 50, 60 hours a week, <laughs> like doing this work. And I'm like, this is, this is a difficult thing to commit to as I'm, you know, I've been married for almost 10 years now. My wife and I are coming up on 10 years next year. Um, we have two kids and at the time we didn't have, you know, any at that point, but when I did decide to make the transition, my son was about six months old Right. So there's like, there's different, I think, life situations that put, that apply different pressures to your decision-making process. Right. And so I'm looking at that and thinking, is this how I want to spend my time? Is this the best use of my time? Um, does this give me the balance that I'm looking for in terms of time that I want to spend in work? Um, time that I want to spend continuing to improve my own skills, time that I want to spend with my family um, and my wife. And so I think that all of that is still possible within architecture. I do. I do absolutely believe that. Um, but for me, I had tried the avenues that at least I was willing to try, <laughs> uh, and that felt like the right fit for me. So that's when I started just l looking at other options and the crazy thing to me, and I just, I don't want this to be true, but it is. And it's that's just that the entry level position of of a tech company was more money than what I had ever made in architecture, which is crazy. It's crazy. It shouldn't, it should not be true, but it was absolutely true. And it had amazing benefits and it had a good work-life balance. And I got to start on a four day work week and I get to work remotely. And it's, I mean, it's just, you know, there's, there's a lot more, there's a lot more um, elements and factors in play now than there used to be when someone has to make a decision about what they want to be spending their time doing. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And uh, I think also in particular in the United States, the situation is uh, a little bit uh, harsher because um, yeah. still in the EU, we have some check and balances uh, put in place. And um, yeah, it differs a lot uh, between the countries, but in, in Northern Europe in particular, they are very um, aware of the importance of a good work-life balance. And, yeah. uh, and actually, it's yeah. so stupid because I uh, recently read a book called Stolen Focus 
Um, it was about more what kind of influence social media has on us, but there was one chapter about the fact that the full-time job of today it's um, more hours than the full-time job of like 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And that um, actually not having time to spend on things you enjoy, like your family or just a me time or just you know, playing with your pet or cooking something uh, or practicing sports, these things makes you less productive. So in the end of the day, you spend the time at the work, but you don't produce as much as needed for the company. And actually right. some companies, I think in the UK it started, they t started testing the 32 hours work week. And they yeah. noticed that uh, people were more productive because they would be sort of in a hurry to finish the work and uh, then enjoy themselves. So this is like some co counterintuitive um, situation, but uh, it is the way it works. And was it the first step to try to find your happiness or fulfillment rather by going solo and like by going starting your own practice and what were the you know i mean in i say always this in the us it's a little bit better because everybody kind of cheer for you and tell like come on go you can do it and people like <laughs> and, and in europe it's rather like you're so stupid why are you doing this you're gonna you're going to for sure go bankrupt or stuff like that. So <laughs> this is the mentality here. Like we are very, very conservative. So how was uh, that experience funny. for you? Yeah. Well, I actually feel like EU does have a bit like there, there is a benefit, especially for, for architects. Right. And that's that I remember, you know, um, experiencing this. I think when I was in grad school, this is how one of the, one of our visiting professors that I had, you know, that I was, um, learning under whose, whose studio I was taking had basically started their practice because they had won a competition um, like early on, um, early on in their careers. And they didn't even necessarily have a practice yet. So it was almost like, you know, those, there's a lot of competitions that are relatively open. I don't know if I'm understanding this correctly, but that's how I understood it at the time, right? There was, there was a competition that was open to anyone. Anyone could win it. Um, it wasn't based on whether or not they had experience or had, you know, necessarily a, a like foundational practice in place yet. And that's how their practice started. And they've, they've kind of been off to the races since then. The U S doesn't necessarily have those, uh, those same opportunities. <laughs> so when you're making the jump, you usually have to rely on personal connections, personal networking in some way, like it's either like a family member needs a a new home or something like that. And you're like, well, I guess, I guess now's the time let's make the jump. Um, or something just kind of haphazardly falls in your lap. And you're like, all right, well, I guess, you know, now is the time. Now is the time to, to make the effort for me. I actually had a friend that had started a practice, um, back near, back near my hometown. Um, and my wife and I, you know, we're thinking about having kids. And so we were at the time we were living in Chicago and we decided to move back uh, to our hometown. Um, this was like right before COVID too, which is, you know, we get then get into a position where we're essentially you know, locked in place for two years. But um, <laughs> so, you know, he was starting his own practice nearby. And I said, you know, what if I come back to, back to Michigan, you know, back to my hometown and I work on expanding your practice back there? Like, I think, you know, I have enough, I have enough uh, family and friends and a large enough network back in my hometown where I think I could probably begin to identify some opportunities for you um, if you're interested. And he, and he was on board. So that was basically, that was basically how it started. And then um, rather than working directly for him, I just ended up starting my own practice so I could do my own projects on the side. And then also, you know, um, work with him on a lot of the larger projects. And that's essentially what happened. And um, did you have any doubts about this? Did you have like, a, you know, uh, some sort of anxiety to leave this maybe more international company in a bigger city as Chicago? Also, I don't know if you did it after COVID started or just accidentally shortly before. So it kind of was an okay. Accidentally now. short before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, shortly. okay, that's great to be out of the big city for during the pandemic. Um, yes. But did you have any like, yeah, a little bit of anxiety or some fears of 
uh, doing this jump or it was like kind of like a very calculated risk? I don't know if I would call it a calculated risk. Um, I don't know. Everything is kind of evaluated differently. You know, you're in a different life situation at the time. It was just, it was just my wife and I, right. We didn't, we didn't have, we didn't have any kids. Um, we didn't have anything necessarily that we, that we had to report to in a certain way. And my wife did have a job that she was maintaining at the same time. So that was a little bit of a safety net and they were allowing her to go remote. So that made that, you know, that gave us a little bit of a safety net to make that decision. But the thing is like even working at a large international firm in a city, like I wasn't making that much money. So I was like, okay, can I, can I match at a minimum? Can I match what I'm earning now just by doing my own thing and having a little bit more control over my time? And I, I was able to do that. And so I think, you know, you have to look at things a little bit differently. It's like, you know, I think understanding risk, you have to understand what is actually at risk, right? Um, or I mean, are you at, you know, do you, should you do it with absolutely zero money in the bank? No, I don't think that's a good idea at all. <laughs> should you do it without being anywhere near family and you're kind of just out in the middle of nowhere and you don't have anyone that could potentially support you if something goes wrong? No, I don't think that you should do that. Um, but if you have a support net, you know, financially, whether that's a partner or whether that's family and you have, the, you know, you have some kind of, some kind of plan in place, some kind of idea, some kind of opportunity to at least start off and, and, and ignite and be a catalyst for that decision. Then I think for me, at least I'm, I'm okay with making that jump. I've done that a couple of times though, to be honest with you, I've done that a couple of times where I've made a relatively aggressive and maybe what some people would consider to be more risky um, change but I like, I like scratching itches. That's kind of what it is. You know, it's like, I just have to experience it and see what it is because worst case scenario, worst case scenario, something doesn't work out. You just go back and find, you know, you go back and find the job. So you have to be confident in your, I think you have to have some kind of confidence in your skills and your ability to at least, um, if not find work for yourself, then you have to go back and, and find a job again. Right. Yeah. So you know, there's, there's a lot of things that play into it, but that was generally the thought process. I have a, one little curiosity because uh, I had already different guests from the United States, one of which was Alex Hogrefe. He's this um, ex expert in architectural visualization. And we were talking about that um, in, uh, in the States, also um, the um, fees for your studies are so high as an architect and as you said also then after that the problem is that the salaries not always uh, match the expectations did you have uh, also the issue of having to pay back some of your uh, tuition fees or uh, you're not in that situation because i know this is a big issue in the states yeah it is a big issue i i've always been pretty um intentional <laughs> with my finances right so for undergrad i went i did my uh i got my bachelor's in science from the university of michigan and i had a scholarship there so i think when i graduated i had i don't know not like a not a ton of not a small amount but not a ton of debt maybe like thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars right for and i was basically there for six years because the other part of the story is that i was studying neuroscience for three years and then i switched into architecture right so i was at i was i was in undergrad for a while um, and so wasn't, it wasn't a massive amount of, uh, debt, at least, uh, for that time. And then, you know, when my wife and I got married, we combined our debt. And so we actually went into grad school and I said, I only want to go to grad school if we, if it's financially reasonable. So I knew that I needed to get scholarship opportunities. So I had applied to a lot of different uh, to four different programs and I got into all of them and I didn't actually necessarily go with the one that offered me the most money. Uh, I went with the one that seemed like the right fit, um, which happened to be Princeton and Princeton also gave a pretty generous scholarship at the time as well. And while I was um, a grad student at Princeton, I also taught uh, as like a graduate student instructor, which pays pretty well there. So basically grad school um, I paid for through the scholarship and through teaching, right? So that, that ended up like paying for it in real time. 
And then at the same time, my wife was actually working full time and we were aggressively paying off our debt um, while I was in grad school and basically putting all of our extra money towards that to the point where I think it was a year, um, maybe not even a year, like six months, six months after I graduated from grad school, we, uh, we were debt free. We paid off all of our school debt. So, you know, that <laughs> I don't know, there's, there's different ways to do it. I, I don't like debt. Um, at least I didn't like, I didn't like academic debt. I didn't like feeling like, uh, that was holding us back in some way. So we did make the decision together to kind of aggressively pay that off. And I'm really happy that we did that now, right? Because that was like six years ago and we haven't had to think about it since then. (laughs) So it's definitely a challenge though. You know, I didn't, so I didn't, I didn't pay for it with, you know, we, we didn't pay for it with family money or anything like that. It was scholarships and it was, I think just aggressive financial decision making. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, one way. And to go back to your um, development of your skills that brought you to uh, starting the Tyler Tactics, um, I was wondering. You mentioned how you jumped into your own practice together with your friend in your hometown. We you have a big uh, network, and now you do all these different uh, suggestions or tips for people to help them uh is there and because everything started i like i really like to have you on the podcast because i'm doing a series where i mainly interview founders um everything started mm-hmm. because i got this book here uh, it's called how to win work yes uh, it's uh and i read it and i was like okay a lot of people write these nice books with um sort of self-help books i don't know i don't know if even sure, if it's yeah. a self-help it's more like a it's actually like a technical book about how to win work as an architect um yeah. and uh, i interviewed many architects that started also big successful practices and i asked them how they did it what were the beginnings um, what would be your suggestion for someone that wants to start and maybe doesn't have yet this network or doesn't, do you need to wait for this opportunity to come like in your case or, or can you proactively do something as you say, also to mitigate those risks? Maybe just, um, if you were to start a practice and you didn't have this opportunity, what would you do? according to your knowledge, like what would be the first steps? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. I'd be curious to know how other people are answering, how other like large firms started, you know, what that first opportunity was. Um, In many ways, I think I write this actually in when when someone signs up for Tyler Tactics, but like I consider Tyler Tactics to be, they're like letters. They're letters to my younger self, things that I should have known. Uh, and that I wish I would have known when I was running my own practice or before I started my own practice, right? And so uh, the, almost uh, all of the content that I write and everything that I share in that newsletter is about this, like you, if you were to group it like way up high in, in terms and like kind of put it in a macro category, it's about this idea of going from a reactive state into a proactive state, right? So no, you don't need to wait for that opportunity to arrive. You can certainly go out and find that opportunity. And so if I was starting without any kind of network, uh, the first thing that I would do is identify the categories of work that I think I can execute best, right? So that might be residential projects or commercial projects or kitchen renovations or I don't, you know, whatever, whatever it is, literally, whatever it is, um, I'd identify what those projects are. And then I would um, begin putting together a list of potential clients that uh, that might need those services. So if you're looking at businesses, you might be looking at public directories to kind of understand this. If you're looking at residential-like projects, you might actually be driving around um, to find homes or plots of land or looking at public directories to see who recently bought plots of land, right? So there's different there's different very much so proactive activities that you can take to just begin building a list of potential clients. And the idea of doing that little bit of research beforehand is just so that you're not just going out there completely cold. Like these, 
these are, you know, these could legitimately be projects or future, you know, or relationships that can develop into projects into the future. And then after that, I would begin reaching out to these people, whether that's through phone calls, which architects tend to be much uh, less comfortable with, (laughs) or through sending emails or direct messages. I personally think that picking up the phone and calling someone is definitely the most effective way and the fastest way to get these relationships started and begin to understand your market uh, better. But if it's more comfortable for you to just start with sending emails first, then you can do that as well. Um, but it's quite literally, you know, it can be as simple as just saying that you're, that you've noticed something and you're curious if they're interested in exploring a project with you or what that, you know, looks like. And, um, another opportunity, again, depending on the type of work that you do is to reach out to the, to the companies that are actually executing the work. And by that, I mean like the general contractors. Um, and that's actually something that I did. So when I started my practice, even though, it began through the first project that we had actually began through um, it was a connection that like my father-in-law knew someone who knew someone who knew someone that might need work. That was essentially how that began. So it was, it was multiple levels down. Mm -hmm. But after that, what I actually ended up doing was that I put together a list of the general contractors in my area, specifically ones that were doing like residential work. And I began picking up the phone and calling them and asking them if they were working with an architect, what they felt about the architects they were working with, and if they would be open to exploring, you know, working with other architects. Because again, depending on your market, um, my hometown is like, it's like a small town, it's suburban, if not urban, a little bit, right? So when people think about building a home or doing a home renovation, they actually don't, they don't think architect first, they think builder. Uh, or contractor first. So, and so sometimes they go to them first and then those contractors and builders actually need to find an architect to work with, to help them execute that project. And so that's why I had gone down that road route as well. So I think there's lots of opportunities, but you do have to proactively, um, you know, be able to do a little bit of research, put together those lists and, you know, just pick up the phone or send an email and begin reaching out to people until one of them lands you're going to hear no a lot. You're going to hear no a lot. And that's okay. That's part of the process. You're still, you're going to continue hearing no for <laughs> the rest of your life a lot. The majority of the time you're going to hear no. Um, with, but, with what kind of portfolio can you start doing this? Can you do it like the start, startup way before there is even a portfolio? Or should you make a little bit like a portfolio, a little brochure that uh, explains your services uh, or... Could you do it as a sort of like, um, you know, when you do just a a test where you just say, I'm this person, I can do this. I will be up to speed in the next two months. I just wanted to check on you and let you know that in two months I'll have my (laughs) company or something like that. So what would be for you in your case approach? Yeah, I think I think it depends it depends on a lot. It depends on the type of, I think it depends on the market that you're pursuing and the type of work that you want to do. But I do think a lot of people fall into that concern where they're like, I don't have a portfolio for that work. So therefore I can't, I can't pursue it. I don't, I don't personally believe that. (laughs) I think you're going to be shocked. I think you'd be shocked in having conversations with potential clients to understand that they might not even ask you to see your work. It, it, it may not even come up again, depending on the market, depending on the type of work that you do. If you are actively listening to them, if you understand what their challenges are and you actually have that ability to kind of, uh, to solve that challenge, um, you know, depending on how the conversation goes, they might not need to see the work. Now, if you feel like you're in a market where you do feel like that's necessary, but you haven't actually done that project, then I don't think you have to wait to have like, you know, you don't have to wait until you have that project or have multiples of that project to begin developing a portfolio. I think you put together a, like an imaginary client, right? What would they do? What would they want? And you put together just like you would in school, you're putting together, you're putting together a project. If I had, if I had a commercial like project, you know, if I had a commercial office or a startup office renovation, this is what I would do. Right. And you don't have, you're not, 
I don't mean to be disingenuous and to put it on your, <laughs> to put it on your page and be like, this is a real client that I'm doing work for. You don't have to do it that way. But um, then at least you have something that you can lean on um, and say, this is the type of like, this is, this is the type of work that you can expect out of working with me. I see. How did you guys start it when you were starting your practice? Uh, because also you were, I mean, your friend, uh, I don't know, did he have already a portfolio or um, w what was based the portfolio on? Because also one problematic thing is that, let's say we have been working for some big uh, practices for several years and you've been working on whether residential or commercial, doesn't matter. Um, I don't know for to which to which extent you can show that work for your clients, uh, also from the um, NDA stand, uh, standpoint right. of view. Like I guess you can show it. Uh, for example, I have in my experience, I've gotten a um, signed document that they say I can show this work for a job application. Like if I apply somewhere, they allow me to show these projects. But um, yeah, they. I mean, it's not okay to. But I don't know, I probably you can go and take pictures of the building and say I did it. I mean, that sounds like, okay, like I work, I, I participated into making this building while working at this company. Maybe that's an option, but I don't know. Yeah, I think, well, th this, this is a great conversation. And this is why, because the, the questions that you're asking are exactly the questions that every single person thinks about, right? This is, this, these are, this is exactly what you think about if you're starting, if you're thinking about starting a practice and you want to start a practice is that you are just entirely focused on a design portfolio, which I think is the wrong, it's the wrong, it's the wrong direction. Don't worry so much about your portfolio or the work that you have. Now, I still, again, I still think it's good to have. It's good to have, but it is not the most important thing. The most important thing that you can have when you're beginning is an understanding of your market and an understanding of what your client needs. You don't need to actually put the effort into building this portfolio or into doing these things until you identify that that's actually required, in my opinion. There's no point, there's no point in doing it. I think you could probably, I, again, depending on the market, I think you could probably get your first two or three projects from without having a portfolio, just from having a conversation and telling, uh, like sharing your experience. Like I've been working at firms for six or seven years. I do this type of work all the time, you know, depending on where that conversation goes. But again, your background, where you work, the contract that you have in place with your workplace. Yeah, having having work that you can fall back on isn't a bad thing. I just don't think it's a necessity. I don't believe that. I think, I think it's our anxiety as architects and it's our training as architects that we only think about design. That's what we're constantly thinking about. We think that clients choose, choose us because of design. They don't, most of them don't. Most of them, most clients are going to choose you not based on the design work that you can do. They're going to choose you because they feel most comfortable with you because they feel like you understand them the most. And so I think if you can, I think if you uh, begin your journey with a foundation of understanding how to best communicate um, and understanding the needs of your market and of your ideal client, you're in a much better position than if you go off and try to put together a portfolio of 10 amazing projects. Because then what's going to happen is that you're just going to pitch your design rather than listening to your client. <laughs> I see. I see. I and you're, see. Just, you're better off just listening to your client and understanding what they need. I see. Um, can you have a combination of like... Um, you, said, you said something interesting before. You said which projects you can deliver at your best and who are the clients. Like this is the first thing you should think about. But let's say I want to rather focus because it's all about fulfillment, right? So maybe I can deliver best uh, designing kitchen for for houses, but this is going to be something that uh, makes me miserable. But what would make me happy would be to design, I don't know, sustainable extension of existing buildings or something that's more, you know, bigger than just getting a paycheck in the end of the year maybe you have just uh, a mission also be beside uh, having the mm -hmm. skills 
can you start from there and say I want to design um, this and like then reverse engineer where where maybe there is a market for this um, who are the clients like can you start from what would you love to do instead of what could you do you can yeah I think it's I think it's dependent upon how much friction you want to you want to work with or work against, I guess would be the way to think about that. Right. So there's a lot of, this is actually kind of similar to this, to this conversation we were having earlier about how to, how to make a career transition if you want to. Right. And this is, uh, so there's two ways to do it. And, and both of them, both of them involve friction. It's just whether you want more friction or less friction and whether you, you need to make this change now, right now, or whether you have time to make it, you know, whether you're okay with kind of merging into it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you need to make this change now, if you are aggressively like you just like, I just need to start my own practice. I need to get out of here. It's time to jump. I think it's better to go less friction, right? Find the thing that you can execute the best uh, because it's going to be the easiest for you to begin executing on. And it's going to give you at least uh, a foundation of let's say of like a financial foundation that you can begin working off of. So you can at least have work coming in It's your own work. It's not the work that's going to fulfill you the most right now you think. Um, but you're going to have, you're going to have a foundation. You're going to have a safety net in place, which you can then move to begin pursuing that other type of work that you want to do. If you have more time and you're okay with a little bit more friction, um, up front, right? Then I would say, yes, you can absolutely go to this point where you're, you would want your first project to be something that you haven't necessarily done before. But that would be by going that route that I was talking about earlier, where you do have to have some kind of proof point in place, right? You can't just like, uh, it, you, it's going to be much more difficult for you to land that work without any kind of proof point, right? So that'd just be by putting together examples of what that would look like so that you have that to fall back on in the conversation should it come up. But again, it's like, it's like it's pacing, it's friction. It's there's, you know, you can, you can approach it however way you'd want to, (laughs) you know? Um, But it depends on, it depends on what your situation is and how, and how you want to do it. I really love this type of conversation with all the other guests also with you and with all the other guests I had before because it's like, you know, uh, it's sort of this, you have a puzzle that you want to solve and somebody gives you some clues and the clues lead you to a different uh, path <laughs> <laughs> which you would uh, have done. I know I ask you some questions also based on like other people that I've watched. For example, um, I don't remember his name, but he has this practice 30 by 40 also based in America. He has done yes, uh, Eric Reinhold. Eric Reinhold, exactly. He has yeah. done entrepreneur books, and I read his books. And also, for example, he says a lot. It's important to have portfolios of only built projects, and so on and so forth. But that's, I think, it's a next step. <laughs> the opposite of what I say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, also, like uh, this guy from the book How to Win Work, Jan Knicker. He's at a, a huge company. I recently visited MVRDV. And he said also it's about, you know, doing great architecture and things like that. So I want to hear the different opinions. And I think your approach sounds very interesting and very smart. But I'm curious, you said when you went with your friend to start this practice and build it up, you, uh, after a while, discovered that you didn't really know how to do things and how you were doing things. And did you get your training once you move uh, in the tech industry about sales maybe? And then the principles you learned there, you reversed applied to architecture? Or where did you get, <clears throat> where did you get your skills? And I'm also curious because I have been digging into this topic a little bit. And then it comes so many side knowledge that you have to have, like, I don't know, I can think about contracts. I can think about when you do your call, how you speak, how you deliver, how you don't sound like a scammer. (laughs) So (laughs) (laughs) so where did you gather all this uh, knowledge and how did you apply it to architecture in particular? 
Yes, it was the it's the former, right? So I took everything that I was learning in tech and then reverse engineered that back to architecture. And I actually don't think that architecture does this enough, right? We're a very, very autonomous discipline, right? We don't we don't like taking inspiration. We don't like pulling from other industries. We believe that everything can be solved within architecture, right? That's just generally how we think. Um, and I think that's not a great approach, especially when we think about it from like a, from like a business perspective. It's not a great ap- approach. There's a, lot of, there's a lot to be learned outside of the way that a traditional practice is run, just from looking at other business models and understanding how Um, other companies run a business. Now, sales, marketing, business development is a little bit, it's kind of like, you know, uh, I don't know, it's like karate, right? It it doesn't change much over time. Like those processes are still the same. It's, it's the same, it's the same ideas, the same principles that were around 50 years ago are the same ones that are around today. They shift a little bit depending on the modes of communication, right? And then there's now social media and there's now phone calls and there's now texts and there's email, right? So there's different, there's different ways of communicating, but the general principles are the same. And I think if you can, I think, uh, you know, for me, it was really about just putting in a bunch of reps, thousands of reps, right. And having those conversations, um, many, many times to under to begin to pull out what these themes are and the things that matter most when you're having conversations with potential clients. And whether I'm having that conversation with an architect um, who I have an end goal of, you know, of getting them to subscribe to a particular uh, software or whether I'm an architect having that conversation with a client that I want to um, subscribe to my services or, you know, that I want to hire me as my services the general framework is still the same. The way that you're supposed to move through that conversation is still the same. The idea that you should be actively listening to your clients and understanding what their challenges are and identifying whether you're the right fit for what they need and whether you can serve them best. That's still the same. Um, And so it was, it was kind of within that realization that I began mapping those things back. And I've also done that, successfully I've used, I've used that strategy successfully in my past as well. And a good example of that is um, when I was an undergrad at Michigan, at least they have a, they have this portfolio competition, annual portfolio competition among the entire architecture school for, for undergrads. Um, And you basically submit you anonymously kind of submit your portfolio to a jury's and they choose, they choose the top one. As a junior, I had tried and I had failed horrendously um, <laughs> to try to try to win anything. Um, I took a much more strategic approach uh, in my in my final year, right, to win this. And actually, instead of looking at other architecture portfolios, I pulled together a list of different kind of. Um, I don't even want to call them design magazines, but they were just kind of, they're kind of like indie mad in indie magazines that I was really attracted to for one reason or another. Like I just thought that they were beautiful and they were easy to read. And I loved the way that they looked. I loved the way that they felt right. I loved flipping through them and I ordered a bunch of them. I ordered like five or 10 different indie magazines that I, that I, for whatever reason or not was really attracted to. And I began pulling parts of their, layouts into my portfolio and the way that they were framing, you know, particular pieces of information and different ways that they were telling stories and different ways that they were categorizing their work into my own, own portfolio, right. And into my own work um, and ended up winning that portfolio competition in, in my final year. Uh, and so I think it's, I just think it's really useful, right. To, to look outside, to look for outside inspiration and begin to understand how that can be applied within the industry. Yeah, that's a great advice. And this is like intuition that you had the back then, or did you um, proactively, I don't know, for example, I read a lot of uh, books about business, about, I, I've mentioned some of them, like the startup method. I've read, uh, I so this year I subscribed for the uh, masterclass platform on Labor Day. They had a good offer. So I'm like doing yeah. some, classes about negotiation and stuff like that because as i said for me it's really um 
it's a real limitation that all architects or um, also this is the education we get is that they think about as you said uh, you need to do competitions like you did um, uh, often there is this thing that there is the people focus on what they need to do instead of what they need to achieve right like you want to achieve that you have a client and uh, yeah. they focus that they want to do a competition which is not getting a client is doing a competition <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 that's why I like that's try. a great example yeah that's a great example yeah like because you don't need a competition to get a client that's why I ask right. you like you need a client right. you don't need a competition if somebody right. gives you a project and says do it like you will be happy <laughs> to do it for money instead yeah. of for free yes um, yes so but this is the education we get I always always um, think about it we get uh, taught to do a perfect work and we don't we don't get an education to do a, a work that it's um, mm -hmm. responding to what the client needs or to what the project needs because if you always need to do a perfect work you need to spend 24 hours at the office and that's of course not sustainable over over your lifetime um, so I was curious like before when you started and when you had these first intuitions there was no uh, Tyler tactics online there to read so <laughs> how did you <laughs> got these intuitions or how did you get this first uh, as I said like uh, um, clues to solve a puzzle like this one yeah you mean specifically around like finding work early on is well, that what you mean finding or... work or as you said for example this example you did with the portfolio it's a very interesting with the portfolio. one uh, not only with the portfolio but with the clients like this first yeah 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 shift of paradigm is very is very hard i don't know maybe also if somebody in your family is an entrepreneur maybe that's also helpful um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't know what was your background like what because i had to learn these things by myself uh yeah I think I'm, I've never been, um, I've never been one to follow like traditional paths. Right. Mm -hmm. So like I said, like I, I, I do pretty, like I'm comfortable with change. I'm comfortable with making change. And so, and I'm also very, uh, curious and skeptical mm -hmm. of inf of like all information that I receive. <laughs> right. <laughs> I like need to prove that the information that I receive is actually, yeah, is actually going to work for me or I like filter it through, through my own, you know, methods and values to begin to understand if it's the way that I would actually pursue or take something on. And so, and so I just think it's important to be skeptical and curious of everything that's in place. But I think, you know, I did at least have the vision to look at the industry as a whole, right? So I studied architecture. I then worked in architecture and I was beginning my own practice to understand that there wasn't necessarily like a practice or a business strategy that I could point to in architecture and say, that's what I want. That's like, that is exactly the type of practice that I want. That's the type of firm that I want. Right. So immediately from that, I'm thinking, okay, well, if that's again, like what you're talking about, if that's not the outcome that I want, then I probably don't need the exact same input to get there, right? And that common input that we all think about is kind of the process that you're asking about and, and that I think a lot of other people are writing about. Like, let's get as much, let's start with design, right? Let's get as much of a portfolio together before we do um, these different things. And so I think it's healthy to begin to question like these traditional methods um, because they've gotten us they've gotten, they've been successful. It's not to say that they're not successful and there's not a, there's not a trajectory trajectory of success there or a path to success there, but it's not the only path to success. Just like what I'm saying to you, isn't the only path to success. You've already talked to people that have like done the complete opposite of what I'm telling you <laughs> and have, and have built like incredibly large firms. And so I'm not someone, I'm not someone personally that's going to like speak into a void and be like, this is the way to do it. This is the only way to do it. And this is the only way that you're going to find success. I think this is, I think what I share and I think what everyone shares is a way to do it. And specifically a way that we've seen work for ourselves. Right. Um, and that we've, that we've found proof points in. So I think that there's a lot of different ways to approach it. And the important thing to do is to 
gather that information just like you are, you know, read books, sign up for newsletters, um, but don't stay just within architecture, you know, take those master classes, take things completely apart from architecture and begin to ask the question. Like, I think the most important question that you can ask is how can I apply this to what I'm doing today? Or how can I apply this to what I, to where I want to be tomorrow? Uh, because then that's where you actually get to really utilize, you know, your training. I think like architecture degrees are almost, they're, they're, they're not named the right thing. <laughs> Our, it should, we should be, it should be called like a degree in creative problem solving or something like that. Cause I think that's, I think that's much closer to <laughs> the skills that we earn and that, that we develop while we're in architecture school. And so by the, you know, taking those external resources and beginning to ask those questions, how can I apply this to what I do today? How can I apply this to where I want to be tomorrow? You're beginning to use that creative problem solving and you're beginning to bring in different modes and different methods into the work that you're doing such that you can create a completely, you know, unique solution um, and unique path for yourself. That's, you know, that's kind of born from your own interest. That's born from your own fulfillment and mission and vision. I completely agree. And as you said, there is no way everybody have to find their way. But in order to find your way, you have to know different uh, recipes and then put the ingredients yeah. together in your own way. I'm curious yeah. in this whole um, background we've discovered about you uh, today, how did you come up with the idea? Like you said, it started because you were sharing your experience about uh leaving the practice and joining tech and then you started Tyler Tactics um, I'm curious how did you like um, uh, why LinkedIn and also like uh, you are very very popular on the platform you I, I mean I found you too somehow through the platform yeah. <laughs> uh, sure yeah so how did you did you start just for fun and then did you start um, digging in more into how could you um, reach more people or was it just a natural talent that the way you deliver information, it's the right one for the platform? I think, um, I think it's a combination of like all, it's, it's a little bit of a combination of all of those things, right? So I started, it was a little bit for fun, um, or just like out of curiosity, like I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what happens if I start posting on LinkedIn, right? So I chose LinkedIn actually because it's a more business oriented platform. If you, I actually don't have, I might, I might begin opening up, you know, Tyler Tactics uh, profiles for other platforms. I haven't yet. I've, I've basically been on LinkedIn for two years, um, kind of like building, building that up. And maybe now I can take what I've learned and apply it to other platforms. I have no idea. Um, but I started with LinkedIn actually because when I started working at Monograph, um, my my manager at the time was saying, "Oh, you know, uh, you all should try to begin posting on on LinkedIn and see if that's a, like, see if that could be a good resource for you, because it ultimately is where business decisions are made." And I think LinkedIn even has this crazy stat on their homepage that says something like eighty. 80% of uh, people that are actively on LinkedIn are decision makers and by decision makers, meaning like there's someone that's in control of some kind of budget and will be making a decision like with that budget. Right. So I think, I think LinkedIn is more professionally oriented, which is great uh, if you have a business mission in mind. Right. So that's, that's originally why I started on LinkedIn and then I kind of approached it, um, I'd say pretty strategically, right? So I looked at people that were already doing well on LinkedIn and I looked at people that were doing well on Twitter as well, because Twitter is kind of easier to search. Can you make so some examples to, um, of those people that you started looking like at? Like Justin Welsh, right? Justin Welsh is someone that does really well on LinkedIn. Um, if you don't know who, who that is, he actually has a LinkedIn course, which I ended up taking just before I started posting on LinkedIn. Um, that I, that I would recommend. It's very good. And then if you're looking on Twitter, I mean, Justin Welsh is actually doing, <laughs> is actually doing really well on Twitter as well. Um, but it's not so important. I don't, I don't think the specific examples are important because what you should do is you should jump onto LinkedIn and you should jump on to Twitter and you can jump onto Instagram and just see like, as you're scrolling, which, 
which posts are capturing your attention, right? That's the first thing is like, what's capture, what's capturing my attention. And then the next thing is why is that capturing my attention? And then how is it capturing my attention? Right. And so you do have to like kind of strategically analyze this work. And so that's, I kind of, I did kind of start there. I said, who's doing, who's already doing this well and what can I learn from what they're doing? And so I began understanding the best ways to kind of format your ideas, right. On LinkedIn. And there's a lot of mistakes around people kind of just like having an idea and then just posting a giant paragraph about it, which just isn't easy to consume or to scan or anything like that. Right. So what they're saying might actually be incredible. It might be very valuable, but no one's going to read it because it's not easy to scan or it's not broken down in a way that's easy to consume. Right. So what you're saying is just as important as how it's being presented when it comes to social media. And so for me, I began to kind of test different modes. You know, I have carousels that I use now and I have only text posts and I have just single image posts and I've tried videos. And so, you know, it's a little bit, it's a combination of consistency. It's a combination of um, testing. It's a combination of then analyzing and then just repeating that process over and over and over. If you actually like want to like grow, you know, if, if that's your, if that's your goal. I think LinkedIn is an incredible opportunity for architects um, to begin posting on that. I'm actually building a course right now uh, that's specific to architects, you know, to help them grow on LinkedIn to understand how they can, you know, convert content into followers, into clients um, as well for, for their practice. So I think there, there's just a lot of opportunity there and it's high value opportunity. It's, I think it's like it's higher value. It's higher intent than what you're going to get on other platforms like Instagram or TikTok or Twitter where people are more like casually browsing, but LinkedIn people are generally there for business purposes, right? They want to become better at something or they're looking for, they might be like using LinkedIn to specifically look for an architect, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your experience, like for example, how often do you um, post on LinkedIn and also the difficulties i have for example personally as someone that can relate to content creation is that um, it's difficult to come up always with something smart and it's also <laughs> difficult to overcome your um, imposters i i suffer imposter syndrome sometimes uh where i think yeah. uh i don't know is it isn't it isn't it douchey to write this thing now or mm -hmm. isn't it, mm -hmm. am I the right person or do I have the background to, to post this? And then sometimes to overcome it, I just think, okay, worst case scenario, not going to perform well or I can delete it and stuff like that. Um, right. How, how do you approach this? How often do you post? How do you come up with ideas? Do you pre-plan all your posts for a while? How do you do? Also, you have uh, very nice uh, layouts for your posts. So <laughs> what kind of tools do you use all this process that on making actually the posts? Yeah. yeah I post once a day, um, every, every morning at 8.06 Eastern time a.m. That's <laughs> what time my posts always go out. Um, I use Canva to create like any, any designed post. Although I really don't recommend that you start with that. And this is, you know, this is part of the, the, th these are, these are part of the things that I plan on, you know, diving really deep into in, in the LinkedIn course, but I, you know, because it does take a lot, you know, this is another common mistake that I see people begin posting on LinkedIn and they start right with like creating very elaborate posts, like posters, poster images or carousels. Um, that are pretty well designed and you can, can tell like it took someone a long time, but actually doesn't get any engagement. Right. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that you should start there. I think that you should probably just start with like text based posts because then at least you're beginning to understand what ideas uh, people are most attracted to. And then once you understand what those ideas are, then you can begin like putting in more time and effort into creating, you know, like uh, image posts or carousel posts or things like that but I don't see any point in, in putting in like the effort, <laughs> the additional effort required to do those things until you understand what's working and what isn't. Um, I use uh, content 
I use a I use a strategy called a content matrix, which actually, if you sign up for Tyler Tactics, you can you can access immediately. Let me pull it up really quick while I'm on this call with you um, to tell you exactly which one to look at. Uh, so I've been doing this for over a year. Tyler Tactics number 38, 38. And I'll send this to you after we get off this call too, so you can have it. Um, but I use what's called a content matrix to generate endless ideas. Literally, there's endless ideas that can be created from it. This is where I come whenever I kind of like, uh, whenever my scheduled posts are beginning to run out, I return back to my content matrix and I begin generating ideas for content again. I use the same thing to create like newsletter content a lot as well. Um, but I think it's also important to have an easy way to capture your ideas when they come to mind. So I use Notion to do that, right? If I ever have an idea that comes to mind, I can pull up Notion or I can um, send something to Notion so that I can keep it there for later and return to it when I am like ready to begin generating ideas again. And do you do all your posts like uh, in a batch way of working? Like, for example, let's say you sit on a Saturday and you make 10 posts and then you're good to go for a while. Or do you do a little bit every day? When do you do it? Because, I mean, you work, you have a family. Uh, so this is also a problem that everyone has. Yeah. Yeah. Time is very limited. I know that if, if I can do it, then I'm sure that other people can do it because I have a full-time job. I have Tyler tactics. I'm a strategic advisor for another startup. I have two kids, a dog and a wife. So I think, I think you can, I think you can probably do it if I can do it. Um, so I usually do the batch posting. Yep. Um, I typically on Fridays or Saturdays, I'll sit down for a few hours depending on, depending on how much, like how successful the previous kind of content generation was. Um, I can usually do one to two weeks when I sit down for, for a couple of hours, I can produce one to two weeks worth of content pretty, pretty quickly and easily um, at this point. And so I'll, I'll kind of batch that together. And then at that same time um, I'll begin like writing the newsletter as well. So I kind of like, I usually do that. I usually devote like one entire day to Tyler tactics. And that is a combination of generating content. It's a combination of working on my course and it's a combination of writing the newsletter content as well. But um, as much as I understood so far, Tyler tactics is completely like just a newsletter for free. And then you started this, I guess, just to try to build up your audience um, but do you offer like consultation to architects like paid wise and now you're saying you're building a class for LinkedIn which uh, will be released at some point so um, have you so far how have you monetized your audience so far because in the end of the day also like this takes time takes work it has big value so i think it's completely yeah. fine to monetize it somehow so i'm curious how did you <laughs> no yeah, oh, totally that. totally like I yeah, mean, yeah yeah people uh, the problem now is that we are oversaturated with content and a lot of people you know take it for granted that it's for free but i think that yes. the future of uh quality content is exactly this decentralized um system that it's being generated now through all the platforms offering the option for the audience to sponsor you or uh, Patreon yeah. or Substack because the traditional media are suffering because they are dependent on sponsors and they do a lot of this clickbait stuff. Um, also, like if you open an architecture magazine, probably 50% of the pages are commercials of Our ads, furniture yeah. <laughs> furniture uh, i don't know sockets uh, stuff like that so yeah. if you really want to have something valuable you need to go to one creator that actually does this for you and and you have to pay for it if you want to have quality stuff otherwise you can stay with the mm -hmm. traditional things so i'm curious how you planning or you've yeah already done yeah, I think, you know, when I started the newsletter, I didn't necessarily come into it with any, um, I didn't come into it with a clear goal of exactly what I wanted to do with the future, right? I knew that I wanted to begin building an audience because I know that an audience is extremely valuable. And I don't mean the audience that I have on LinkedIn, which is great. It's great to have whatever, 20, 23,000 followers and people that 
that follow me on LinkedIn, but I don't technically own that audience. When you have a newsletter, when you have like an, people that are subscribing to your newsletter, people that subscribe to your channel or something, then then you have more uh, influence upon them, right? And I think a newsletter specifically or or a subscriber list is the is the most valuable thing you can have. It's far more valuable to me than like my LinkedIn followers um, or something like that, because I have a direct line of communication to those people, right? Within, within their inbox. So that's originally why I started it. And now I think of it more as like a long-term goal as really becoming this uh, educational resource for architects, almost like a, like a media, a media resource for architects. So I'm beginning, you know, slowly, but surely to build this out. And the reason why I'm comfortable with the pace that I'm moving at is because I do have this, you know, I have a job that I love at monograph. Right. And I enjoy doing that. And, um, and so because of that, I can, I can kind of like take my time building these things out. Otherwise I think I would probably be doing it a lot faster, <laughs> but I don't have as, I don't, there's not enough time in the day for me to do that. So my long-term goal with Mon- or with uh, Tyler Tactics is to continue giving value for free. I think that's what you have to do to grow. I think I, I do believe in that, um, providing value for free. And the reason why I think it's actually okay to provide value for free is that it's still, you know, there's still a very low conversion rate for people that are actually executing on that value that I'm giving out for free. Right. So you can have, like, I can, I'm, if you look back at, I've, I've, I think I just sent this morning my 56th, my 56th tactic. And when you sign up for Tyler Tactics, you get free access to all of those other 56 tactics. Right. I'm very confident extremely confident at this point that if someone were to go through and read all of those past newsletters and actually take the steps that are recommended in those newsletters to improve whatever their processes are in their practice, then they could significantly, significantly improve their business, significantly improve uh, their ability to attract high quality clients. Like just, you know, they, they could maybe even double their business. Like I, I feel very confident in that because I know that the, that the value that's provided there is very good. I don't necessarily think that they will. (laughs) I don't think that they're, because I don't think, because then there's the whole strategy of like execution, which usually sometimes does require, you know, what you're talking about, either a consultant or an advisor that's that just, that's there for accountability purposes and to answer those questions that are very specific to your situation. Right. So that's why I'm okay with giving value away for free in order to grow the audience. Um, And that's why I plan to, you know, dive deeper into specific situations and provide specific examples and open up opportunities for working with me one-on-one in different ways or for me to help you win a project or for me to help you, um, you know, uh, help your business development process and system become more efficient in different ways. So that's where, you know, beginning to build out these courses. I also offer some, you know, specific things that's like, oh, you know, I'll help you um, increase your conversion rate on your website um, just by, you know, you, sh- you send me your website, I'm going to send you five ways that you can increase your conversions today. Right. So I begin offering different services around the needs of my audience. And I ask them questions on every, you know, you see the polls that I, that I post on every newsletter, um, to begin to understand, you know, what their needs are, what their challenges are. And then I have conversations with you and with other people in my audience frequently, right. To begin to understand what challenges they're facing, as well. And then map that back into the newsletter, map that back into my ideas for what I want to do for products. But, um, the way that it's the way that I have sustained it monetarily, uh, over the past year is because I have found great sponsors. Um, and I'm very guarded, <laughs> very guarded with the sponsors for Tyler tactics, because I want them to actually align and provide value um, to the readers, because I'm with you 1000%, <laughs> right? There's who are the sponsors, if you can mention some. Yes. So my first, the first sponsor ever for Tyler Texas, and I will say like the sponsors to me are incredibly valuable and they should be incredibly valuable to yeah, the, yeah. to the readers as well, specifically because I was, I, I was on the line 
I was just about to begin charging for Tyler Tactics. Like I was going to make it, I was going to make it a paid subscription yeah. because uh, just like, just like you're saying, actually my wife who, who proofreads every single one of my newsletters is always like, you should not be giving this away for free. <laughs> that's, that's what she says to me every single week. Um, so I was very close to beginning to, you know, make that a paid subscription and then um, I began reaching out to potential sponsors to see if they'd be willing to fully support it. And so I had, you know, that has turned out to be successful for me, which has kept the newsletter free. And that is, that is the entire reason or because without it, then I, it just wouldn't be sustainable for me to continue doing it. I can tell you that the sponsor right now is Rayon, right? And Rayon is incredible. They're basically a kind of a mix between BIM and CAD and they help you um, produce beautiful floor plans. Um, and it's, and it's really nice because I don't know if anyone else kind of has gone into that same boat before, um, where they've, where they're beginning to draw, uh, floor plans. And then you're looking for different blocks that you can use, or you're just like, you you know, you're drawing your own pieces of furniture or you're drawing your own piano or whatever in the floor plan. Um, they already have a large library and they can produce, you know, they can produce beautiful, beautiful floor plans that, that you can put on your website very quickly. Um, and I was actually speaking with the founder, Stan, over the summer when he was showing it, like he gave me like a live demo of it in person. And I think within like two minutes, he made like a really, like a really beautiful floor plan. And I was like, wow, that's incredible um, how quickly you can do that. So, so uh, Rayon was the first one, or sorry, Rayon is the, is the current sponsor, right? And there's been... Other sponsors in the past that uh, there's different sponsorship opportunities, but I typically kind of package them as like monthly or quarterly packages where they can have, um, where they can have exposure to my newsletter and my, you know, LinkedIn following for different periods of time. No, this uh, definitely sounds great. I mean, also it's a, as you said, it's a, for the sponsors is better because you curate who is the sponsor in the meanwhile, if you go to one of those big platforms, you get all kind of um, commercials, and I don't think they every <laughs> yeah. every single one is checked. Yes, it's important. It's important to me that the sponsors that are actually using it and who I'm going to be promoting is something that I've seen, witnessed, um, can attest to in some way. You know, to being to being valuable to architects. Because if not, then obviously I lose the trust of my I lose the trust of my audience, which is which is very valuable to me. And I think there's also a reason why in Arkle, Arkle was the first sponsor and they're also, um, they're a tool that's very helpful for kind of um, getting your conceptual design out. Right. So they're kind of a collaborative 3d design, like a mix between Rhino and BIM and Revit kind of all in one uh, where you can quickly put together boards and put together design concepts um, within the platform and a web-based platform, you know, rather than being something that's like uh, something, something like Revit where you <laughs> can't really easily be in there all at the same time, right? It's always a little bit of an issue. Um, so Oracle's another great one, but, but yeah, it's important for me to, to maintain that trust with my audience, right? To actually be providing them value, valuable like tools or resources that I know that I would actually want to use as well if I was running my own practice. But that's why I also keep that sponsorship spot in my newsletter like relatively small. I don't want it to take up a lot of space. I want to present that value, like that valuable resource and that valuable tool up front um, in a few sentences. And then I want to spend basically, you know, a thousand words <laughs> giving them a very valuable tactic that they can begin using. I have a question that um, might be a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know. I'll try. Um, and it's a thing that I've been um, considering lately because I have many now former guests of the show that became my friends. Uh, I know a lot of people. And this is a characteristic of our generation is that most of the things that um, are started by millennials are some sort of courses or spreading their knowledge, which is totally fine, but I don't see enough people starting actual businesses that um, I don't think none of the people that I've invited so far has um, it's been a millennial that started their own architecture practice that do actual buildings. Um, mm -hmm. And um, like now also this kind of Marketing is starting to get oversaturated and you can get all kind of advices. 
without saying like as i said i find a lot of value of of your newsletter but have you yeah. considered creating something like um i don't know a sort of a boot camp or something like it's more like a where people gather with you um, i don't know maybe you do it uh, yearly base and then they maybe it's expensive i don't know that's fine uh, just you get five, six, ten people and they say, I want to start my practice or I want to grow my practice. And then you do sort of this group session like, uh, I don't know, the CrossFit groups where you go there and then yeah. actually you can check <laughs> if somebody has lost some weight or no. Uh, so yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. That, <laughs> that, that you, I would never, definitely I would need also that kind of training. But um, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> but like, we can do, we can do a book. Yeah, we can do the CrossFit boot camp together. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean that, that, you know what I mean? That actual if you create a class, right, many people might surprise, so subscribe for this class and you're going to give them the best advices for growing their LinkedIn uh, page and then they won't follow them because it's nicer to watch the class instead of doing the work probably. Uh, and I say, this, <laughs> <laughs> and I say yeah. it, it's, it's true. It's like for, for me, it's the same. I can yeah. watch all these yeah, classes. Absolutely. Uh, or I know uh, uh, if we compare this with losing weight, everybody can tell you eat uh, whole foods, uh, eat less, uh, do a little bit of movement, Go on walks, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, walk. It's very simple, but yet not not in a lot practice, of people. It's difficult. A yeah. lot of people yeah, don't do right. it. Uh, I read this concept in in, in lately about um, uh, what is it called? Cruel uh, cruel positivity. This is a thing that you know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's called cruel, cruel optimism. Cruel optimism, is. sorry, cruel optimism. Yeah. You're correct. Yeah. Where people tell you, like, uh, I don't know, you want to start a business? It's so simple. You just have to read all the business books. So you have to do. <laughs> you have to wake up at five, meditate, read, write, blah blah blah. And yeah. Yeah, and then there yeah. is a couple of people like uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk that maybe achieve it, and all the rest of us then blame ourselves that we don't achieve it. So like have you considered maybe creating something that it's uh maybe as i said more premium but then the people yeah. that actually do have to show up every week and show you tyler i made uh i don't know i improved the ceo of my website i've changed uh, the way i post stuff on linkedin we've grown so much and then if they don't do something you actually teach them again or something you know what i mean because yeah. for me it's really valuable if somebody manages to create a course that then actually uh, fosters 10 practices then then actually go out there and right. do the right architecture do the next good project and stuff like that yeah 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 i think that's an amazing question i love i love this question because i think about these things all the time and I actually already alluded to that a little bit earlier, right? When I was saying there's a ton, <laughs> tremendous free value in, in my newsletter archive that I know people aren't executing on, right? It's just because it's just our nature. Like if what you're saying, you're going to read it, but you're not necessarily going to do it all the time or you're going to pick and choose which things you're going to do. And so I think what, what actually you're describing is probably that's like what we would generally refer to as a cohort. Right. And that can be a cohort like in person or it can be a virtual cohort where you're meeting for, you know, you're meeting regularly every week or every month or something. And you're all working towards a common goal with someone that's kind of leading you through those steps and can address your specific questions individually along the way. That's absolutely something that I'm thinking about. I think about doing all the time, but I also consider myself to be very early on in in Tyler Tactics. Um, and what I want to be doing. And I do want to fully come up to myself to Tyler Tactics in the future, but I have to be cognizant of my time input as well, right? So it's like a little bit of a balance because I think what I've definitely learned in generating content is kind of that it's the same thing that I was talking to you about earlier, right? Like I think a big mistake that a lot of people make early on is they put way more effort into like their content than they have to. They put content, they put way more effort into their content by like creating overly designed carousels or poster images before they understand what their market actually needs and is attracted to. Right. And so in a similar way, um, I do, I, I approach my business actually in, in the exact same way. 
meaning I want to make sure that if I'm going to put my effort um, and a cohort is obviously a lot more, it's a lot more active effort, right? So I want to make sure that if I'm going to put my active effort and time into something, then it is exactly what like my audience wants and needs. Um, And it's going to solve a large issue for them. So for me, actually doing the course is a, is a, let's say it's like, it's a safer step in that direction. The course goes really well. People begin responding and being like, Hey, like, do you offer consulting for that? Do you want, like, can you help me grow specifically? I have these specific questions. I can map those back into the course and I can also like what you're saying, uh, do, do a premium version of that. That's like, okay, you've done the course. Now let's do a cohort. You know, we're going to work together for the next three months and you will (laughs) absolutely see, you know, growth on your LinkedIn profile and, and your, you know, client base as well. So I think there's, there's a lot. Yeah. Yes. I definitely think about it. Yes. I absolutely want to do cohorts in the future. Um, but I am taking a, I'm taking a more time, like I'm, I'm taking a more patient approach, I would say, because I have, because I have the time to do that. Um, so I'm taking a more patient approach first to understand exactly like what my, what my audience wants. Um, and what they resonate with most and what they, and like what's going to help them the most before I then go out and do it. Yeah. I've asked that just because I like could think about many topics that I could teach, but I, I want to try a different way. And that's why like, I'm curious, like I would, as a, a part of your audience, I'm giving you the feedback and maybe it's uh, yeah. interesting for you. Um, but we I'll sell it to you first, $10,000 $10, if you want to do it right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Yeah, can I is like uh, paid in the next 10 years? <laughs> yeah, there you go. $1,000 a year. <laughs> All right, it's a good passive yeah, income. It it's yeah. a good passive yeah. income. Good passive income, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think we covered uh, um, a lot of topics that uh, surround you. I think that uh, I know you now better uh, personally, and I love this because it's so, in my opinion, it's very beautiful to talk to a person and also the people who will listen, they will be part of this conversation and they will know you better too. Um, and uh, I'm very thankful for your time, also especially because it's weekend and as we know, you're <laughs> now very busy. Uh, my, always, my last question to every guest is to create this sort of uh, um, different pot of inspiration, like where everybody can get an inspirational tip from every guest. And uh, we are all creatives. We sometimes are in roots or something that it's difficult to overcome. Is there some activity, some book, some place, some movie or something that you like to do in order to get inspired and recharge your creative batteries? Yes. Great question. And before, before I answer the question, I'll say thank you so much for being patient with me <laughs> and, and, uh, and, uh, letting me kind of jump in like three months after you asked me <laughs> into, into bringing me onto the podcast. And thank you for anyone that's been, um, generous enough to give their time to both of us for this last hour and a half. And I hope that it's been valuable to you. Um, Yeah, so I'm inspired by a few different things. I would say I'm inspired by great writing. I I find great writing to probably be the most inspirational, especially now, like focusing so much on content creation. I think great writing is is very helpful for me. And so there's a few writers that I love. Um, George Saunders is one of them. He's a best-selling short story writer. I love his stories. Um, I I don't even know how to describe them. They're somewhere in between being realistic and unrealistic and funny and not funny and too close to the heart, you know? So George Saunders is an amazing short story writer. Highly recommend his work. I love, I love reading it just for kind of creative inspiration. Um, Edgar Allan Poe, right? We've all, we all learned of Edgar Allan Poe in school, but we have mostly only read one of his poems. (laughs) I have his whole, I have his whole book. uh, I have his whole book behind me somewhere. Um, Amazing writer extremely vivid and so descriptive and visual in the way that he writes. He knows how to paint a picture in an incredible way and brings you into the story and allows you to be a participant. So I, you know, I find his work to be incredibly inspiring as well. And then of course, uh, uh, Louis Borges, right. Um, 
another great writer, just very imaginative and creative in the way that he thinks through ideas. And it's not, again, it's not just in the the way that they write these words, but it's in the idea in general that they're presenting, right? And so I think, again, breaking that down in the same way that we've thought about things in the past, that I would like explain things earlier, I think is really useful um, with any type of content that you're consuming to be thinking about different ways that you can map that back into your life. And obviously the last thing that inspires me now is just uh, my family, right? I've got a one-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son and to watch a human grow right in front of your eyes is just mind blowing. It's mind blowing. Uh, I love how curious they are. I love how many questions they ask. I love the way that they think through things and the way that they think of doing things and executing things and the mistakes that they make and the successes that they have, just the way that they see the world is amazing. And I'm constantly like taken back to that curiosity and just in getting to be, you know, their, their father every day. So I, I think that's been very helpful for me in the past few years. It's great to hear. I really wish you all the best. Uh, I'm really thankful to have you head on the podcast. And I always say to everyone, this is your first time on the creative insider, but it doesn't have to be the last time <laughs> because uh, things evolve, new things come up. So whenever there is something you want to discuss, like your next class or whatever topic you want to be um, talking about, the platform will be yours. Thank you very much, Tyler. And uh, all the best. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.